Y'all ever seen Brewing Yeast do it? Hello everyone, welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. In this episode, we are getting super nerdy and very technical about yeast, specifically about breeding hybrid yeast strains with our guest, Dr. Matt Winans from Imperial Yeast. The springboard for this conversation is that Imperial recently introduced a new Imperialis hybrid yeast series. And the first release from that series is now available, I-22 Capri. It's a single strain yeast born of two very popular Imperial strains, A38 Juice, a go-to for hazy IPA fermentation, and A43 Loki, which is the lab's Voss Kvike strain. And when I say we're getting nerdy, I am not playing around. In the course of discussing the Imperialis project and all things Capri, Dr. Matt dropped science on the process of sporulation, his explorations in bioprospecting, hop creep, and we even get into the topic of sake brewing for a bit at the end, which I find endlessly interesting. I do hope you'll watch the entire interview, but if there are certain topics you're more interested in, check out the chapter time codes in the YouTube video description, and you can skip ahead to exactly what you want to see. One quick note before we get started, the beer that you see me sampling and discussing in this interview video with Dr. Matt was actually brewed by our good friend Dono, lives like a block and a half that way. It was fermented with I-22, literally one of the first pouches out of the facility at Imperial. They were nice enough to hook us up with some sneak preview pouches and Don brewed a New Zealand blonde. So we just wrapped up his grain to glass video last night with tasting notes so that you can follow the breadcrumbs to his video and his recipe in the video description of this video. And another cool bonus, Imperial Yeast and Tannery Run Brew Works out of Pennsylvania collaborated on a hazy IPA recipe they consider a perfect fit for the citrus forward character of Capri. This is the same recipe that Tannery Run brewed and Imperial Yeast served to great fanfare at this summer's Homebrew Con. You'll also find that recipe link in the video description below. All right, let's get geeky with Dr. Matt. We making hybrid yeast over here, y'all. Hello, Dr. Matt. Thank you so much for taking some time to chat and tell us about some extremely exciting new things going on at Imperial Yeast. Hey, Chip. Thanks for having me here. It's a uh... It's been a pleasure so far chatting with you, and I'm hoping to really get down to some brass tacks here with the I-22 and our program. So Imperial just launched a combo strain uh, from a new hybrid series called Imperialis. Um, but before we get into the strain itself, I-22 Capri, some recipe suggestions, some usage suggestions, uh, just tell me, you know, this is brand new out of Imperial. Um, tell me about the hybrid series, kind of why you're going into that space and kind of what the goal is along the way. Yeah, so the Imperialis project is a project that we came up with when I first started here, which has been about two years ago. And our aim with the Imperialis project is to increase the biodiversity of brewing yeast which in turn is going to enable unique and great tasting fermentations. Um, you know, and that can be anything from the IPAs to sake to wines or whatever, but to enable great tasting and unique fermentations uh, and to do and promote education while doing that and helping uh, spread a little bit of brewing science. So that's the, the aim of a project. We've got a few other objectives below that as well. Uh, what kind of kind of attributes and characteristics do you and your lab crew consider important when you're developing a blend? I mean, we always hear of kind of co-pitching kind of as a, as a thing that people talk about, but here you are deciding the blend for us, the percentages of two or more 
strains kind of what goes into the idea of like solidifying one of those and then making it available yeah so historically a lot of people yeast manufacturers and and us included have done uh blends or co-pitches you know where you take a strain uh, for instance like our um our uh, a24 dry hop is going to be a blend of a20 citrus and the uh ao4 barbarian so that's a blend. And when you use that over time, sometimes the, uh, the exact ratio of the yeast change if you want to repitch it. Uh, so that's a downside to it. But, you know, when you're creating uh, a hybrid or you're, or you're breeding yeast, then what you're able to get is a single inoculum or a single strain. Um, and most of the time when you're doing this, the yeast that's uh, a result of this is going to be a blend or a mosaic composition of the two parent strains. So I hadn't thought about that. So a hybrid series release isn't necessarily a, a blend that's a, is it a morph? Is it still a single cell strain? It's a single point? cell. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a single cell. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole new strain. Okay. And um yeah, so this one here, the, the I-22, um, during the breeding and hybridization process, we were taking Loki and juice and we were going through sporulation and, you know, the brewing yeast is, is kind of difficult to go through sporulation, but it does happen every once in a while. And, and there's some other tips and tricks that you can do uh, to get better results. If you look at a plate of the I-22, you know, we have this very juice and ale like large colony morphology where the margins and the elevations um, are kind of high crater like formation with some um, kind of like wrinkly margins and then if you look at any type not any type but if you look at most kvike strains <clears throat> you know they're going to be very smooth um, and so that's one way that we have a, and the dye uptake is very similar too, but that's one way that we have a, a blending of the, what we call phenotypes or just mm -hmm. the physical attributes. That's crazy. That's, you sound like a geologist or like a, you know, a, a cartographer of sorts. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Margins, elevations. Uh, but those are actual descriptors used to describe large colony morphologies. Strains within this series. Uh, will they always be in your mind kind of combo of already available strains or will you be digging into the bank getting stuff that's not necessarily like already publicly available to kind of really throw some different curveballs in there yeah so i almost touched on this earlier when we were talking about the imperialis project and <clears throat> we got to the to the aim of the project but you know, I'll, uh, I'll answer that question, but I want to talk a little bit about the objectives because it kind of is covered in there. But, um, you know, with this first I-22 Capri, you know, we hit one of the objectives, which is to explore the sexual cycle of yeast, and that allows genetic recombination and, and breeding to occur. Um, and so to just dive down a little bit on that, basically when we ferment, and whenever we propagate, our yeast is going through a cloning cycle. So you know how they're budding yeast. You have a clone of one, it buds off from the mother, and then you have another clone. Um, but with yeast, it's a fungus, and it can go through a sexual cycle where you give it a non-fermentable carbon source like potassium acetate, and it can change the parameters a little bit. And then it will go through a sort of like a, a hibernation or a survival state where it creates a spore of itself. So the cell wall becomes an ascus and it has four, uh, you know, sexual cells, sexual spores inside. Um, and so that's one of the objectives that we have under the Imperialis project. Um, another one that we want to uh, use and highlight is, is bioprospecting. And, um, we have an emphasis on, on capturing like local flavors, so to speak. And yeah, so there are some strains that we have in our bank that haven't been released that are, um, you know, 
going to be used for different projects. And yeah, it's definitely one of the ones that we have coming on the pipeline now is um, is kind of utilizing those. So we have the tried and true ones that we started off with, and now we have some, you know, completely, well, it's all completely new, but yeah. yeah. Do you mind showing those plates again? That was really interesting. Yeah. You don't yeah, have to say um, what it is that's on there, but just kind of show the difference of, uh, unless you want to save that for like a temperature discussion, but I think it's a cool thing. Yeah, so if, if we focus, uh, <clears throat> if we keep talking a little bit more about bioprospecting, one of the things that I found when I was in grad school is that temperature really makes a huge difference, especially when you're you know, trying to do environmental isolation um, and brewing beer and fermentations in general. Um, so I just got done rafting the, the Rogue River, the wild and scenic section. And if anyone's never done it before, I highly suggest you do it. But along the Rogue, I took some environmental samples and um, I incubate them back in the lab. I do that kind of almost any time I go on a trip. I go yeast hunting. It's kind of a good excuse to get out. Um, but yeah, so I've got a couple of plates here from a buyer prospecting project that we're working on now. And let me see, let's move this beer out of the way. So here is a plate, an auger plate that doesn't really have a lot of growth on here. Now this is incubated at 30 degrees Celsius, which is typically what you grow brewing yeast at in the lab at least. Now, if you just lower the temperature to around 22 degrees Celsius around room temperature, then this is the difference of all the growth. So you can see it has a ton of different growth in here. Now, this is a little overgrown for most people, at, you know, for most these scientists, I guess. Um, but you can see just quite, or just how different they are with the temperature. And this is the same for other environmental samples as well. Um, you know, more things grow in its natural habitat, you know, wherever you pull the sample from, than elevated temperatures. Um, but you still get good growth. So you have to really play with it. And, you know, one of the things that kind of gave me the idea to play with temperature is looking into research that's being done in South America. And so what they had done there originally to isolate Ubionis, which is the, the parent of the lager strain that was lost forever. Um, you know, it's cold down there. And so to incubate that one and capture it, you really have to decrease temperature uh, for normal incubations. So uh, I always play with temperatures when I do incubations. If anyone out there is trying wild incubations, you know, temperature is really important. Obviously, pH is as well. Take multiple samples, source. put them into different scenarios. Don't just yeah. rely on one situation. Well, if you have a cold area in your house, like maybe a basement, you know, I, the way I imagine it, right? Like I have a cold basement. My middle is kind of where I do my normal activities. And if you have an attic, that's probably oh, yeah. going to be hot. So yeah. you could take samples and throw, you know, up there or down there or in the middle. No, I know the struggle, like here in Minnesota, I think I did this in one of our Northern Brewer classes, but I showed with like one of the laser thermometers basement floor was like 44. Mm. First floor was 63 upstairs where all of our heat goes and our super inefficient house is like 82. <laughs> yeah. 20 degrees difference Fahrenheit. each. Yeah, floor. I do that in the winter. I take buckets from floor like, Oh, I'm going to, I need to wind this down a little bit. I'm going to put it on the first step of the basement stairwell. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess steps would be a pretty good, uh, yeah, pretty good increment. <laughs> a step. Yeah, yeah halfway degrees. up. No, just one step. One step. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the first release. Uh, we've kind of talked about, but let's dive deep into the first one out of the Imperialis Gate, which is Capri, a child of juice and loki your hazy ipa your voska vike what makes capri better than or uh, at least very unique from the sum of its parental parts yeah as i was saying earlier whenever you do breeding you get a, a mosaic or a, you know a blending of the two parent strains 
And <clears throat> we find that, you know, Capri, it, it is quite different. It has a lot of, uh, you know, great fermentation, great acidity, and it also has a great um, flavor and roundness. And um, mm -hmm. it is very unique though. So I think that as we said before, where you have a blend, you know, two different strains as a co-pitch, then over time when you reuse those, they kind of get out of proportion. You don't really know what you have. Um, but with a single pitch, a single strain, um, you're able to monitor that and know your, know your beast a little bit better. And uh, yeah, Capri ferments great and it has a lot of great flavor. So it works really well with hops. And we found that um, using a little bit of active fermentation, dry hopping is really one of the tricks to using this strain properly. Okay, so if uh, if something, let's just say a hazy, was fermented with juice, Loki, Capri, are you able to kind of walk through just what a little bit of those kind of like changing nuances you would expect from, you know, just kind of like a basic recipe, a recipe X with these three strains against yeah. each other? Yeah, so we've done that in the past. That's one of our... Um, one of the things that we do here in lab to evaluate strains. Um, and yeah, uh, so looking at just physical attributes, you know, juice is gonna have that chain forming, whereas the other two don't. And, you know, one of the things there's, I, I can't really name this because we're going off of sensory here. So it's a little bit less analytical, but, you know, if you ever taste a, a Kvike, like lager or an IPA or something like that, there's there's a certain quality to it that you can kind of name. I, I'm not really sure if anyone's come up with the correct terminology for that. But in my opinion, I don't think that the I-22 really, really has that. Um, it ferments great. Um, you know, you're going to get your classic hazy IPA off of juice, you know, every, you know, giant, you know, fruity esters that everyone loves. Um, and so you, I-22 really follows somewhere right in the middle of those. Does it have any, you know, Kvikes are so infamous for being able to go pretty high on the temperature scale, even though temperature scale for Loki isn't necessarily like a hundred plus, but mm -hmm. do you think it uh, is, is well suited for being fermented warmer than you would usually take juice on its own? You know, we've done a little bit of trial with uh, fermentation temperature here. And if you go too high up, um, you know, you're going to get your typical off flavors at high temperature. Yeah. But we've seen some some good results with elevated temperature. You know, and this is still an ongoing project for us. Um, but I will say that right now we are recommending normal ale temperature. So that's shooting right around 68. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I feel like. And this is completely off of topic, but like, I feel like with cold IPA, I've been researching it and doing content on like, it's kind of broken the rules on like, what's too high, what's too hot for a strain that says this range and what's too cold. And so I feel like, to your point, the nerdism about temperatures is just such like an accurate, probably a smart place for us to be at this point in time where you feel like there's nothing new under the sun. You're like, we'll, we'll mess with temperature for a while like your fifth element temperature temperature is super important <laughs> like, um so you guys super with... important and when i was building my home brew setup um yeah i think i spent right after getting all grain i think i invested pretty heavily in time and resources and to temperature control that was kind of my go-to i mean as far as like i don't know as a all grain starter, you know, once you get your, how to make wort and that stuff down, fermentation temperature, I think is super important. And you guys at Imperial worked with Tannery Run Brew Works out of Pennsylvania for a hazy IPA, kind of a, a recipe, uh, a standard setter for this strain Capri, which we'll share. Awesome of you guys to share that, awesome of them. It'd be awesome to get it from them. Clearly I can't get it here in Minnesota. Yeah, but if you would have went to Home Brew Con in Pittsburgh, we had it on tap. I heard. It's so, pretty good. So tell me a little bit about the recipe, why it works with this strain, and maybe what reaction was to, to people who stopped by the booth. Yeah, a lot of people liked it quite a bit. Um, you know, 
with it being a new strain and with this collaboration, uh, we weren't really sure exactly what we we're going to get putting it together. Um, but what we found out, though, is that using the hop schedule that they had um, and then also using uh, the I-22, you know, we got really great flavor compounds from those hops. Um, you know, it produced a really good beer and, you know, all the hops that go into it, we're kind of looking to get a lot of uh, citrus out of yeah, really any, any kind of ale or IPA that you're brewing and you want like good citrus notes, uh, the I-22 is going to be pretty good for that. And, um, you know, putting together the uh, hop schedule on there, you know, Amarillo, Galaxy, uh, we have Cascade, uh, uh, Nelson Savion we have in there as well. And so these are all really great hops. And um, yeah, the, the Capri just kind of killed it. Cool. So we'll, we'll put that recipe out there. I wanted to let you know, you guys sent us uh, a big old box of sneak preview pitches, which was super nice of you. So my friend Don Osborne, fellow brew tuber, has already brewed with it two weeks ago ish. So he's got what he's calling a New Zealand blonde, uh, pretty much 100% North Star Pills. Hot oh, wow. Liquid hopped with pacific jade and waimea 1055 down to 1008 which i thought was rad and i wasn't i was wondering if that was loki knocking at the door a little bit it's young it's still kind of clearing up and getting mm -hmm. carved but it's uh i would say big orange tangerine citrus i almost get this like saltine cracker with like a little bit of pepper um, oh yeah because i saw that he had the Oh, what hop did he have in there that's got a, it's, it's like a bold hop. It has a lot of that peppercorn on there. I think there. Pacific Jade kind of does that. Yeah. And he, he has it, you know, for whole boil and then also for like a long whirlpool. So yeah, this is rad. I mean, it'll get more carbonated, but mm -hmm. it's a super cool first beer to, to taste with it, considering that this strain launched at HomebrewCon like two weeks ago. How's the uh, flocculation on that one? Um, I mean, it's, I think in a keg, it's going to get clear. This is not a hazy by any stretch of the mm -hmm. imagination with a hundred percent pills, but Don kind of has that. That's kind of his process. He, he kegs pretty early and then just doesn't necessarily drink it super fast. So it kind of like has almost like this lagering conditioning phase in the keg. A little maturation process. Yeah. Yeah, we found that using the strain and some of the bigger tanks, it really um, really hangs out quite a bit in big tanks. But uh, once you get to the home brew scale uh, and, you know, and five gallon or six uh, that barrels, that is, um, yeah, it, it really flaws out. It can produce a very bright beer if needed. Yeah, and I'm sure this will. He pointed out that he didn't use gelatin, which he usually does, because mm -hmm. he just kind of wants to see. I just wanted to ask, since we've talked about Hazy, and Don's first idea was just to throw it in a beer he'd already been planning to brew anyway, which was a kind of just a blonde with New Zealand hops, New World hops. What other styles, if people are burned out on Hazy's and have no interest in them, where could you see this child of Loki and Juice going? And maybe even like temperature is kind of a thing there, depending on where you want to push it. But where else could you see this being pretty functional in the beer landscape? Well, obviously IPAs, right? I mean, I think that's been pretty well established. Um, and regular pale ales as well. I, I think it produces a really good session pale ale. Um, you know, we've used a little bit of it in, um, in like some rice uh rice um like ipas and stuff before um but anything that has or wants to highlight a, a citrus hop or a, a citrus flavoring of some kind i think it's been pretty good um i'm really interested to see what people do with it outside of those parameters i mean i think you can probably we've done some a little bit of research with sake brewing on it and i can speak more about that maybe in the next interview um but yeah, I want to see if someone, you know, co-pitches with a, with a Brett or, or something like that, how that will go. I know that homebrewers are very happy to try all these things out and yeah, can't wait to hear it. It does, again, it does really well with uh, active fermentation dry hopping, which is pretty important with this strain. 
Um, and, you know, that's going to help with um, the flavor enhancement of those hops. It's also going to help with uh, mitigating any hop creep. What is hop creep? Like bullet point? I've, I've heard it so much and I don't know much about it, but like what's, what is it and what's to avoid about it? Um, so I guess it's probably more important if you're working on a production scale, but basically it's once you ferment your beer, okay, and there's dextrins in the beer that's unfermentable to most yeast. And so you hit what you think is your terminal gravity and then you're dry hopping and those enzymes within the hops, or there's a little bit of debate of where exactly the enzymes come from. Um, you know, I think there was a paper that came out with, um, oh, I forget who was the editor on that one, but uh, they were debating whether it came from the hops or the enzymes came from, um, you know, bacteria or yeast or some other microorganisms that may be on there. But basically it's when you hit your terminal gravity and it's a false terminal because you dry hop and then it's going to take those dextrins to convert them to fermentable sugars. So you could get hop creep, like let's say you package it real quick in a can and it could, you know, cause some problems or oh. you know, basically your hop creep is going to take the fermentable sugars and creep away or chomp away at them. Really? Okay. It reopens fermentation a little bit. A little bit. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, I've been seeing it a little bit and I saw where I think somebody maybe presented on it at Homebrew Con or something, but yeah. So, so many things to be concerned about. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of it, you would just be kind of, your head would be spinning because it, you know, there's so much to consider all the time. I mean, beer is such a complex matrix. There's so many components to it. Um, but one, fortunately for us, one of the best sensors or detectors for the quality of beer is it's going to be our our mouth or our factory system and you know that's where i'd like to see a lot of people kind of focus is doing a triangle test on some of these um some of these beers or techniques um and i think that's really going to give us good ideas whether or not things make flavor impacts and and how different some things are you mentioned it and I, I won't ask you to go too deep because i know that this isn't the, the conversation, but you did a sake brewing presentation at HomebrewCon. Uh, you name dropped like three strains, two of which aren't necessarily available to homebrewers all the time. You mentioned that Capri might be an option for, for sake brewing. Uh, I know you got some trials, so we're not going to sit here and be like, well, what did you find? But what about a sake yeast um, puts Capri kind of in that wheelhouse? Yeah, so in general, there's what's known as the Japanese Society of Brewing Science. Um, and I might, I might quote that a little bit different, but they're the ones that have the yeast cultures and they distribute those to different sake breweries every year on request. And so when you get a strain from them, a yeast strain for sake brewing, uh, they're Kaioke Kobo and then whatever number is associated with them. So the two most popular strains are uh, number seven and which is our a27 hiroshi and number nine which is our a49 goodness and yeah we produce those but mostly on a commercial scale and so we don't really have them in packs now they might come out as a seasonal here uh, but you can also use i22 and we've got some some trials going on with that so i might have better results um, to talk about next time you know, right now we've kind of focused on IPAs and, and that was kind of the initial go-to as far as what styles, talking with people uh, that they wanted to see uh, and what actually fermented well. Um, but what makes a good sake yeast is a good question. And number one, you're going to want temperature tolerance because most of the time you're looking at around 15 degrees Celsius uh, for fermentation of sake. Um, Obviously, you want it to be able to be okay in the carbon and nitrogen environment that it's in for sake. Uh, and then as far as flavor notes go, you really want to balance the acidity and a good floral profile. Uh, you don't have to have a, a super exquisite floral profile. Uh, number seven is a yeast strain that has a really robust fermentation 
And it's got a good flavor and floral profile, but number nine, it really substitutes some of that fermentation characteristics with uh, really high esters and really floral content. Um, so with that being said, that's the acidity is what kind of kills most yeast strains as far as being able to use with sake. Um, you know, number seven, number nine, uh, there were a whole list of numbers that came before that. And most of those are not in use today because they produce too much acid. It's too strong. Like Stranger Things. Yeah, <laughs> this is way too strong. <laughs> number seven, number nine. Um, and I'm thinking purely sensory and like, but when I saw that, I was like, what? And then I was like, well, so many, to your point, so many sakes are very fruity they're almost luscious and then a lot of them can be hazy you know when I think of juice I just think of this like milkshake of a beer so I don't know something about even the sensory part of that made sense to me and I don't know if Loki can tolerate a little higher alcohol because I know that sake you know can be more wine strength even though it's more of a oh, yeah. brewing process it's wine-ish strength right mm -hmm. Yeah, the sake brewing process is, is really interesting. Um, and you, you can get a lot of different flavors and styles of it. I mean, I remember when I first went to Japan and I had sake and I only had sake maybe once or twice before in the States and it was your typical, um, your typical restaurants, you know, sake where it's just one style, the Jinjo, it's kind of, you know, very bright and very strong. Uh, but there's a whole smorgasbord of different styles uh, and it's so delicious. Uh, but yeah, the cloudy is the nagori, which is the coarsely filtered. Uh, and I really like that one. It's a, it's a very silky drink. So yeah, maybe we can follow up on Capri and sake. Or I, I just thought it was interesting because I don't even like go to the commercial part of the Imperial Yeast website a lot. I didn't know that you guys had sake strains, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for Humbrew Con, we put a uh, we put together a collaboration with uh, Sango Kura, and they're the only sake Kura in uh, Pennsylvania. So, oh. um, yeah, we work with them quite regularly. So they had a sake in bottles or on tap at the booth. Yeah, we had it on tap. Um, oh. So. Trying to remember what all we had on tap at the uh, Humbrew Con, but we had our IPA with uh, I-22 Capri. Uh, we had a cold IPA. We had a Belgian Blonde. And I think we had one other one as well. Another IPA. And yeah, and we had sake on tap as well. Was well, there anything else you want to say about Capri before I cut you loose? Because it's been a minute. Um, let's see if I could think what's like a good Capri in a nutshell statement. Um, yeah, so it's, it is a small single strain and, um, it really chomps away well at normal ale temperatures, maybe, maybe slightly elevated. We're going to have to see what people uh, do with it. It, um, it does have a little bit of, uh, sulfur nose on fermentation, but that quickly dissipates. And once you have it, as it is mature, it's, uh, it's got a great flavor fruity profile. And uh, in large tanks, it can hang out for a while, but once you bottle it or have it in smaller tanks, it can produce a very clear and bright beer. Nice, would you expect Final Gravity to be lower pitching Capri than say with the parental juice? or not necessarily, uh, all things being equal? Uh, all things being equal, it would probably fall somewhere between those two. Um, and that's what we've seen in, the, in our trials as well. It's following the final fermentation gravity falls in between Juice and Loki. All right, Dr. Matt, cheers to you. Cheers to all of our friends at Imperial. Congratulations on your new baby I-22 Capri. Uh, thanks, Chip. I really appreciate it. And if, uh, if you brew with it, let Imperial know, let Chop and Brew know. We're going to put Don O's recipe out there. We're going to put the 
Tannery Run, Hazy IPA. There's all kinds of fun shareables out of this discussion, which is always fun to have a recipe to go with a strain. That's super fun. So appreciate oh, yeah. y'all making that public for the people. Yeah, we really put together uh, at least one really good recipe. And, you know, there is quite a few tweaks that you can make to that one to make it your own as well. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>